If you got a Bible, would you turn with me to 1 Samuel 14? 1 Samuel 14. I want to preach this morning about moving from fear to faith. Moving from fear to faith. And I love this picture behind me because it's something I've always wanted to try. Has anyone in this room ever been skydiving before? Anyone ever? Anybody want to go skydiving? Anybody like don't even test me. Like I am never getting on a plane with a parachute on my back. Okay. So oftentimes in life, we have these opportunities where we're faced with a thought of fear or a thought of faith. And when I started writing the book Mind Games 10 years ago, um, I thought that I had walked through a lot of moments of fear or faith, depression or, you know, walking into a, a season of victory, choosing what I was going to allow my mind, my heart, my mouth, um, and really my life to meditate on. Because what we meditate on takes root. If we meditate on defeat or fear um, or depression, it's going to keep on really taking its rule in our life. But if we meditate on faith, if we begin to fix our, our thoughts on faith, we can start to walk out a life of faith. The battle for out here starts between the ears. If we're going to win out here, we got to win in here. As a man thinketh, so is he. So if I think fearful thoughts, I live a fearful life. If I think defeated thoughts, depressing thoughts, I live a defeated, depressing life. I make decisions based on what my thoughts and my emotions are meditating on. And in 1 Samuel 14, verse 1, it says, One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his armor bearer, Come on, let's go over to the Philistine outpost to the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Here's why he didn't tell his father. In verse 2, it says, Saul... The, the, the father of Jonathan, the king of Israel, was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. So King Saul was defeated. He was discouraged. He was having migraines under Migron. And he was camped out in depression and this place of total defeat. And he was surrounded by enemy armies. The Philistine outpost was bigger. They were stronger. They outnumbered Saul and his army. And Jonathan wanted to sneak away to see if there was victory on the other side of his faith, on the other side of his courage. And so he sneaks away, and Jonathan had left, and no one was aware, it says in verse 3. Now I want to go to verse 4. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. So this was very dangerous. What Jonathan was about to do uh, could not only risk his life but risk the life of the man that he was bringing with him. He was inviting this guy into a very risky situation, and he knew that even if they get past these cliffs on both sides, even if they get through this very narrow uh, pathway up towards the Philistine outpost, it's two against thousands. And so he says, let's go. And I love in verse five, here's what happens. One cliff was on the north, and the other cliff was on the south, and Jonathan said in verse six, he said to his armor bearer, he said, let's go over to the outpost to these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Perhaps. Perhaps could also be used as the words, what if? What if God shows up? What if? Those two words have the power to either paralyze us or propel us into our future. What if things don't work out? What if our marriage doesn't make it? What if our kids don't get healed? What if things don't turn around in the business? What if the economy collapses? What if things don't go the way that we hoped they would go in 2024? What if those two words, perhaps, what if? What if God doesn't show up? What if God doesn't provide? What if God doesn't protect? What if this whole thing of tithing and trusting God with our finances, what if it doesn't go the way we thought it was gonna go? And what if can drive us into a paralyzed place of fear or we can flip that what if, and it can propel us into an action of faith. When I think about Grand Grand celebrating 100 years, I think about how Grand Grand had to really challenge the what if questions in her life. She really had to move. Listen, you don't make it 100 years in a church like Victory, 38 years on staff, loving, serving, living, helping people on the other side of losing her husband, tragically, on the other side of losing her son, suddenly, burying her own child. 
You don't make it to 100 years with a smile on your face without moving from fear to faith. And I don't know about you, but I wanna make it at the end of my life, not as a defeated, depressed, bitter old man, but as a man like Grand Grand smiling, saying, thank you, God, I'm finishing strong. Anyone in this room wanna finish strong with the legacy of faith? So here's where it starts. It starts by moving from fear to faith. Fear says, by the way, fear and faith both ask us to believe in something we can't see. Fear and faith both ask us to have the same amount of energy, mentally and emotionally and physically. Fear wants us to act, think, believe, speak with our energy going towards the negative outcome, that it's, it's gonna get worse, doomsday is coming, we're gonna end up broke, we won't make it, we're gonna lose it all, things are gonna fall apart in this relationship, but faith says God will provide. God will protect. God will lead me through this storm. God will restore what the enemy has stolen. God's going to meet our needs. God is in our future just like he's been in our past. God has destined us. He has designed us. He has made us to succeed and prosper. The plans God has for us are good plans. Here's the key. What we meditate on is what's going to take root. So if we meditate on fear, it's gonna drive our life. We're driven by our thoughts and our emotions. If we use the same energy that we use towards worrying and being afraid, towards worship and faith, we can see a greater outcome in our future. I remember in 2020, the first week of March, we're coming up on this four year anniversary, um, when I, I started hearing these rumors on the news about people closing down. And that there was this virus that had started spreading and it wasn't in America yet, but it was on its way here. And, and I remember turning on the news and people were telling me, oh, it's gonna get bad. It's gonna get really bad. I said, well, how do we know? They said, it's, it's taking over every nation. This little virus is taking over every nation. It's, it's spreading, it's on its way here. It's on a cruise ship on its way to America right now. I don't know which of you were on the cruise ship, but, <laughs> but I remember when it hit America, when that cruise ship came and the virus began to spread and it wasn't just a virus of a sickness, it was a virus of fear because it began to shut down everything. And then our government announced, hey, there's only a few essential places that are gonna fix this virus. There's only a few essential places that are gonna help solve the, 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 the virus of COVID-19 and fear and anxiety and worry and panic. Here's the essential places, cannabis shops, you could stay open. People need weed. Secondly, we need um, liquor stores. So people need to drink as much alcohol during this season. And then Walmart, right? Walmart's essential. But the church is not essential. People do not need. And that's when I said, hold up. Hold up. You're telling me that during a, a, a time of crisis and virus and sickness and disease and fear and depression and suicidal tendencies and people literally losing their minds, you're telling me that people don't need hope? You're telling me that people don't need Jesus? You're like, this is what the church was born for. Jesus did not die for an internet YouTube channel church. He died for a physical manifestation of a gathering of men and women who put their faith in Christ, who are the hands and feet to people who are sick and hurting and, and disturbed in our world. And so I, I challenged our team. I was sitting with our core team. I said, guys, we gotta do something. We gotta stay open. They said, let's do it. We're with you. Now, this was a moment where we could have said, what if, what if we open up and it's terrible? What if we try something right now and it doesn't work out? Perhaps this is the wrong idea. Perhaps we should follow what everyone else is doing. But our team started to lean into the perhaps. We, we began to move from fear to faith. We began to believe that maybe perhaps God had positioned Victory Church for such a time as this. And that if we couldn't meet inside the building, God had blessed us with a beautiful outside campus to minister to the people in our parking lots. And someone on our team said, what if we rented the, the, the um, drive-in movie theater in Tulsa, Admiral Twin Drive-In Theater? I said, why would we rent that place out when we have our own drive-in movie theater right here in our parking lot. And they said, but we don't have any screens. I said, we don't need screens. We'll just get on the rooftop and we'll do Victory Church out in the parking lot from the rooftop. And y'all, when we did that first service four years ago in March, 
We announced on social media, hey, we're not shutting down. We're gonna do rooftop revival services for anyone who wants to come. We'll social distance in our cars for anyone who's afraid of contacting the sickness and we'll, we'll do whatever we need to do to follow the CDC guidelines, even though the CDC people weren't following their own guidelines, but we're gonna do what we need. Like, we're going to do our best. Hey, don't get mad at me. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just reporting the news. But I remember we got out there and we said, we're gonna pass out grocery bags. And in one night, we passed out 5,000 grocery bags. 4,000 people filled the parking lot. People flew from all over, and they drove from all over to come here. And then I got a, a text message from our governor, this, the governor, governor Stitt of Oklahoma, and he said, Paul, I got your number from someone. I just want you to know, if the mayor tries to shut you down, I'll send the National Guard. I got your back. Victory is needed for such a time as this. I said, thank you, governor because I'm getting threats that we might get shut down. And he said, it's not gonna happen on my watch. And he said, thank you for standing. Billy Graham said, when one man stands, the spines of others are often stiffened with courage. When one man takes a stand of courage, all it takes in this moment where Jonathan was, was perhaps, he was saying, perhaps, what if, even though his own dad was saying, hey, we're, we're done, we're defeated, it's over. Like, we just need to stay in this place. The Philistine army is bigger, they're stronger, they're, there's more than that. And yet Jonathan said, but what if God is on our side? What if we move from fear and depression and hopelessness and these migraines, like God's not gonna show, what if we move into a place of faith? By the way, as we started passing out grocery bags, we ran out, and businessmen and women in this church heard that we ran out, and they said, we wanna help. How, how many bags of groceries do we need? We said, as many as we can get. There's people who need help and hope and groceries in the gospel every day. And, and people were getting laid off from work and people weren't sure how they were gonna make it. There was a lot of anxiety. And so we started passing out grocery bags every day at the Dream Center in North Tulsa and then right here at Victory in South Tulsa. Then we started passing out at the Hispanic Victory Church in East Tulsa. Then we started partnering with smaller churches in West Tulsa and all across Tulsa. Then the White House called us. And farmers to families, Ivanka Trump, she said, we want to partner with um, this, this disaster relief team that works with Victory Church, Terry Henshaw. We want to get grocery bags through Victory and the Dream Center and the Disaster Relief Center. And we want to feed Midwest uh, America through your church. Y'all, in less than 12 months, we passed out 16 million meals and bags of groceries. So the next year in 2021, during the Super Bowl, Amazon put out a commercial. Y'all know Amazon? The guy who owns Amazon, he's a billionaire. His name's Jeff Bezos. And Amazon was touting that they had given 12 million bags of groceries during COVID. I started getting text messages from, from church members, many of y'all. Pastor, we beat Amazon. Pastor, we beat Amazon. Listen, Amazon, we should expect a billionaire. A, like, he has more money than all of us in this room. We should expect that guy to give 12 million bags of groceries. But a local church in Tulsa, Oklahoma... 16 million bags of groceries. Are you kidding me? This is what I'm talking about right here. When we all move from fear to faith, we can change the world. We can heal communities and neighborhoods. When we start living like Grand Grand with that mindset of, you know, I was thinking about Grand Grand. And I've got this, um, I got this red, red ball of yarn here. Pastor Ty, will you help me walk this out? All of us in this life, we have a certain amount of time. None of us are promised 100 years. Turning 100 is a rare thing these days. That's pretty amazing. But most of us in this room, during our lifetime, the Bible says that life is a vapor. So our lives are like this part of the thread right here. That's, that's your life. That's 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, maybe 110. If you're 110, we'll give you a little bit more right there. But the rest of it is eternity. And Pastor Ty's still walking. Eternity goes on forever. What we do in this vapor of a life, if we live with fear, I'm not starting a connect group. Nobody's gonna come. I'm not launching that company. It's gonna fail. I'm not gonna ask her out. She's gonna say no. I'm not, I'm not believing for us to have kids. The doctor said it's impossible. We're not going to try anything new because fear talks us out of every idea of faith. And what we do in this little part of our life echoes in eternity. It goes on and on. What we do for these 80 years, we're sitting here tonight, today celebrating Grand Grand's 100th birthday. You know what I asked her? I said, Grand Grand, 
what have you learned in 100 years? She goes, it goes by faster than you think. Don't blink, Kenny Chesney. Don't blink. Life goes faster than you think, Travis Tritt. Life goes faster than you think. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. So if we're only here for a little bit on earth, then I want to do everything I can to live a life of faith. I want to try every idea. I want to launch every dream. People say, when is victory going to stop building? You guys just keep building new things. And when are you just going to give it a rest? I don't think we should. I think there's still work left to do in our city, in our state, our nation, in the world. I think fear and depression and defeat talks us into giving up on ideas and dreams and moving forward and living and breathing and loving and forgiving and trying again even after you failed and getting back up even after people said you're not qualified. Listen, I don't wanna spend my life living under the fear of man. I don't wanna spend my life living from the fear of shame and regret and failure and it's not ever gonna work out. I wanna spend this life, if, if this is all I got, I wanna spend it living by faith. I think this is where Jonathan was at. He was saying, Dad, I know that we're outnumbered. I know that we're not as big as the Philistine army. I know that we're, we really, like the odds are stacked against us. I know it's impossible. I know we're considered non-essential. But perhaps, perhaps God, look at that again in verse six of 1 Samuel 14. Perhaps God will act. Perhaps the Lord will show up. We sang that song today, the Lord will show up. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. Nothing can stop the Lord from moving in our lives. So I wanna give us real quickly three ways, three ways that we can move from fear to faith. Three ways that I think God wants all of us in this room to move from fear to faith. Number one, we gotta learn how to visualize the victory before we see it. Before you see the victory on the outside, you gotta see the victory on the inside. Hebrews 11 verse one says, now faith is the confidence of what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. Everybody say, see it before you see it. My dad used to take us out as kids and he would say, what do you see? Throughout the Bible, God asks this question, what do you see, Jeremiah? What do you see, Ezekiel? What do you see, Isaiah? What do you see, David? What do you see, Solomon? What do you see? And he wasn't asking them what they see in the natural. He was saying, what do you see in the supernatural, Habakkuk? What do you see in, 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 on the inside? Because you gotta see it in here before you see it out there. And, and, and really what Jonathan had to do was visualize the victory. He had to see the victory before the victory happened. No matter what situation you find yourself in today, you are not a victim. You are a victor. God is going before you. God is preparing the way. God is lining up the right people, the right breakthroughs, the right opportunities. Get ready for the goodness of God. His mercies are new this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. Don't, don't overwhelm and panic. I remember I was on a mission trip with our church and we were in Mexico when all of a sudden a hurricane came on our second day there. And at first it started as a tropical storm. And then they said, hey, this tropical storm just turned into a category two hurricane. And our team, we were like, oh no, because our missions, where our, our team was staying from Victory, we were, me and Ashley were leading the young adults, and we were staying in a missions base in Roca Blanca, right on the beach. And uh, this missions base was made of rock, but it was literally right on the Pacific Ocean. And the tropical storm turned into category two, then category three, then category four. And we couldn't get out of there. We were stuck. That hurricane lasted for three days. We were in the middle, the eye of the storm. And I was, I was worried, I was anxious. All the birds and the bats that lived in that area of Mexico flew underneath our little missions base and they were all right outside our room for three days, just bats hanging there staring at us. I was more scared of the bats than I was the hurricane because there was thousands of bats and, 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 and it was just a, it was a scary situation. The water flooded the first floor, then the second floor and we were all huddled together on the third floor. And I wasn't sure if we'd get through it. We had 30 people from Victory and Ashley and I, we were the leaders in charge of these 30 people. And then after the hurricane, we made it through the hurricane. Everybody say, you're gonna make it. 
We've got to not just visualize the victory over dreams and goals, but visualize the victory through hard seasons, through storms you walk through. When you're walking through a crisis and you're not sure, how are we going to get through this virus? How are we going to get through this crisis? How are we going to get through this circumstance? How are we going to get through this failure? How are we going to get through this situation? We've got to learn to see that there's light at the end of the tunnel. God's going to see us through. God's going to get us through. We're going to make it to the other side. Number two, don't just visualize your victory. Vocalize your victory. Don't just see it before you see it. Say it before you see it. Sing it before you see it. David used to say in Psalm 42, David used to talk himself out of depression. In verse five, he says, why am I discouraged? Why am I so disturbed? Why am I so anxious? Sometimes you gotta talk yourself out of depression and talk yourself into victory. The victory confession we say every week, I wrote it in the parking lot of our church in 2012, in the fall of 2012, when I was super discouraged, things were rough, and I remember I just, I didn't wanna preach, nobody wanted me to preach, I don't know if God wanted me to preach, I just, I had to preach on a Saturday night, and there was hardly anybody here, and the Lord said, change the narrative, change your confession, stop speaking so much defeat, because I was saying things like, man, our best days are behind us, God's finished with the Darty family, and then there was, there was a voice of encouragement. My mom and Ashley and Grand Grand, different ones, you would, would say encouraging things. But you could get all the encouragement from people out here. If you don't believe it in here, none of these encouraging words will matter. Because at the end of the day, you've got to be your biggest encourager. David had to take authority. You know, the Bible says guard your heart. You can't guard something that you don't own. I can't show up in your backyard and say, I'm guarding your yard. You're like, Paul, you don't own my yard. Get out of my backyard. I'm guarding it. But I can guard something I own. If I own, if I own a piece of property, I'm gonna guard that property. I'm gonna do whatever I can. In the same way, we've gotta guard our emotions and our thoughts. And when we're starting to feel defeated and discouraged and we wanna just speak it out, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. By faith, we speak we speak the word. Don't stop speaking the word of faith over your kids, over your future, over your family, over your finances. How do we move from fear to faith? We gotta say it before we see it. So David said, why am I discouraged? I will praise the Lord. I love Isaiah. Isaiah says, sing out, O barren woman. Look at that, Isaiah 54, verse one. Sing out, you who've been told that you can't have children because you're about to have children. What Isaiah was saying was, Sing out prophetically what looks impossible naturally. Sing out by prophesying what God's about to do, even though in the natural it looks impossible. You say, Paul, that sounds crazy. No, no, no. Throughout the Bible, there's a lot of things that sound crazy. And, and, and we don't follow logic. Like the world doesn't understand a lot of Christianity because they're, they're going, this doesn't make sense. There's a lot of things that don't make sense in the Bible. There's a lot of things like Jesus rose from the dead after three days. Does that even make sense logically to a scientist or a doctor? But, but God defies what looks natural and logical and possible. And I think God wants to defy some things that look natural and logical and impossible in your life. But it starts with getting your faith. What are you gonna meditate on? What are you gonna sing about? You can sing about your defeat, your discouragement, your depression, the impossibility, or Isaiah says, sing out, O barren woman. Joel 3, verse 10 says, let the weak say, I am strong. Let's stop giving fuel to the negative feelings and let's start speaking and singing out what God says about our future. He's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the promise keeper. Nothing is impossible. He's the healer. He's the great physician. Come on, if you want to testify first, just take 10 seconds to thank God for who he is and what he's doing and what he's going to do. Stop letting the negative thoughts and feelings. You can't walk in victory if you talk in defeat. I wanna sing a song to you. Can I sing a song to you this morning, this afternoon, whatever time it is? All right, three of you want me to sing a song. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing it for, for a couple of you. <laughs> uh, two days ago, I wrote a song for my grand grand. And I, I haven't written songs in a while, but I just got inspired. I started thinking about 100 years. What would it be like to live 100 years? And this message that I'm preaching is really her testimony. Like, Grand Grand has lived a life from fear to faith, moving from fear to faith. And, um, and so I, I started just thinking about her story, and, and these words came to me. And, and I'm, I'm moving from fear to faith singing this for you because I've only sang it twice now. I sang it last night in service and in the 9 a.m. service. 
and um, I'm, I'm overcoming the fear of rejection that you guys are gonna be like this. Like some guy came up to me last night, he's like, that was the longest song I've ever heard. I was like, okay, I gotta shorten it. Whew. All right, fear to faith, let's go. How do you measure a life of a hundred years? How do you count all the blessings and all the tears? I'm sure pain was part of her story, but that ain't why we're here. Cause my God's been faithful for a hundred years. Grand Grand has seen it all, highest peaks and hardest falls, but she's still standing tall after a hundred years. In 1924, my grand grand was born. During the Great Depression, whole world had fear and so many questions, but her dad and mama held little Iru, said, don't worry, darling, God will get us through. Cause God's been faithful through the hardest times. He won't forsake you in your darkest nights. He'll be there, he'll see you through when your world's unstable. One thing I learned over a hundred years is God stays faithful. In 1940, she got married to my grandpa, Mr. Darty. They had three sons that grew up and their life was such a party till it wasn't when her husband suddenly passed away and her sons came there to pray. Then my dad said, Mom, come stay with us in Oklahoma. I know it really hurts, but we just started a church called Victory. Hey, Victory. You could come help our family. See, you could get bitter or you could get better. Stay in your rocking chair forever. But God's not finished with you yet. What do you say, Mom? My grand grand said yes. Because God stays faithful through the hardest times. you through when your world's unstable. One thing I learned over a hundred years is God stays faithful. She moved to Tulsa in 1985. Hardest worker in the church, she still keeps us all in line. She was my first date I took out on Valentine's in 2002. She wore a red dress and I wore my suit. I'm still wearing it right now. We ate burgers, we drank shakes, talked till it got really late. I told her all my dreams and goals. She said, with God, you can do anything, Paul. Cause God stays faithful through the hardest times. He won't forsake you in your darkest nights. He'll be there, he'll get you through when your world's unstable. One thing she learned over a hundred years is God stays faithful. The night my dad passed away, she said to me, this ain't the way it should be. Why did he go before me? Parents shouldn't have to bury their kids. But she said, Paul, God's still with us in this. Oh, grandson, God's gonna help us through this. And with tears in my eyes, I said, grand, grand, I don't know why, but I know he's not finished with us yet. There's still a reason to keep on living, keep on working here with me. I want you to see the dreams of victory and help our family. You could get bitter or you could get better, sit in that rocking chair forever. 
But you could keep living, you could keep loving, keep on serving the church with me. She said, grandson, it's all I know to do is keep on living, keep on loving, keep on serving next to you and your brother and mother and sisters. This song has so many words in it. And Ashley too, cause God stays faithful through the hardest times. get you through it when your world's unstable one thing she learned over a hundred years is God stays faithful and that's it thanks guys love y'all grand grand love you happy birthday number three here's the last point right here mobilize your victory don't just visualize I want the band to come out don't just see it don't just say it move towards it. Jonathan could have stayed in the, in the thought stage or even in the, the verbal stage of saying, hey, perhaps God will do this. But if you read on in 1 Samuel 14, it says, then God, then Jonathan began to move. And when Jonathan began to move, God began to move. Many of God's miracles in our lives are motion activated. That when you take a step towards what God's asking you to do, he multiplies your steps. Momentum happens when we move in obedience with God, even when we're afraid. Living by faith requires you and me to be faithful to what God has called us to do, and not just faithful, but to move forward in obedience. When Jonathan began to take those steps, think about the story of Joshua. I think about the story of Esther and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and David versus Goliath and Moses against Pharaoh and Joseph when all the odds were stacked against him and Abraham and Isaac when everybody was leaving and Isaac sowed seed even during a famine and he saw multiple harvests come into his life. I want you to stand your feet all over this place. God wants you and I to experience a life of victory, a life of faith. And it starts right here by moving from fear to faith. Whatever it is that the enemy has tried to discourage you in, overwhelm you in, convince you that this is the end, convince you that it's not gonna work out, things won't turn around, things will never change, you'll never change, you'll never break out of those bad habits. That today, I want us just to close our eyes and just fix our thoughts. Paul the Apostle said in Philippians 4, verse six, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, pray and make your thoughts known to God. Make your emotions known to God. Let God know where you're at. God is not intimidated by your problem. He's not, he's not overwhelmed. You could never gross God out. You could never scare God. God's never surprised by how messy your situation looks or how difficult or impossible it looks. God looks at those things that, that seem impossible in the natural and he says, that's a little thing I can do if you trust me. And sometimes you get to see the miracle and sometimes you get to be the miracle. Sometimes you don't always see what you're praying for turn out the way that you hoped it would turn out. But just like the testimony of Grand Grand's life, that's not an excuse to throw in the towel. That's not an excuse to cave in to fear and depression and get bitter and stay in that rocking chair forever. That's, that's a reason to say, you know what, devil, you're gonna pay for what I've walked through. And I'm going to make sure that I spend the rest of my life living by faith and not by fear or bitterness or defeat or discouragement or staying in this deep place of depression because life didn't go the way I thought it was gonna go. I, I think today's a day to tell the devil, he loses, God wins. You're gonna give it all you got no matter what you've walked through, no matter what disappointments you face. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today, and this message is speaking to you to get out of fear and to step into faith. I want you to lift your hand up all over this room to change your words, to change your thoughts, to change your actions from fear to faith. If you raised your hand or you wanted to raise your hand or you just need to surrender to God, I want you to leave your seat. Come and meet me at the altar today. If you need to get right with the Lord, come and join us today. We're gonna cheer on brave men, brave women, stepping out from fear to faith. Listen, if there was ever an altar call, 
that you should step out and go down towards. It's an altar call to move from fear to faith because fear will keep you in your seat. Fear will keep you thinking, what will people say? What will, doesn't matter what people say. They didn't call you. They didn't create you. Don't let them break you. This is your day to say, I'm getting out of fear, out of depression, out of insecurity, out of failure, out of shame, out of this depression. I'm gonna move forward by faith. And if you're here today and you need to repent of your sins and you need to surrender and ask Jesus to be Lord of your life, come and join us. This is your moment. Salvation is here today. Come and meet us at this altar. We're just gonna worship God for a few minutes all over this place. Let's just fix our thoughts, our hearts on God. Go ahead, let's worship. You move, you move the mountains. God is not finished. Your best days are still in front of you. You're here on purpose because you have a purpose. God loves you. He's with you. He's with you. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, they said, hey, uh, do you think the book that you wrote, do you think it was a success? And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I said, I, I think it was a su success because I obeyed God. And sometimes we define success based on what people say about us or if New York Times declares it a bestseller. And I said, it hasn't really been declared a success by New York, but I think it's been a success in the eyes of heaven because I've obeyed God and what he told me to do. And then I thought, because the enemy always loves to stir up feelings of fear or defeat or whatever, and I thought, it's not too late though, because if God wants this book to go around the world, he can do that. And for some of you in this room, you might feel like maybe it's too late for certain things that you've been waiting for, praying for. Abraham thought that. He thought he had missed his chance to have kids. He was like, it's too late. I'm in my old age. It's never too late. It's never too late for God to do a miracle in and through your life. And I just felt like there's someone in the room today as we were praying and worshiping, I just felt like the Lord was saying, I'm not finished with your testimony. God says he's not finished with your family. He's not finished with your story. He's not finished with what he's put on the inside you. He's not finished with what he wants to do through you. I believe the best days for Victory Church are right in front of us. I believe the best days for Grand Grand are right in front of her. I believe the best days for my mom. I believe the best days for my wife. I believe the best days for you are still in front of us. And I just believe that no matter what you're up against right now, I just believe that God is in our midst. And when God is in our midst, Jonathan said, perhaps the Lord will show up. What if this year we stopped giving so much energy to the negative what if, and we started just living with this audacious faith, saying what if, what if God wants victory to give away 
18 million meals of groceries this year? What if God wants victory to start more churches around the world? What if God wants your business, your family, your dreams? What if God wants to do not just what you think he can do, but beyond what you could even imagine? That nothing is impossible for God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ask, hope, dream, or imagine. You say, I don't know, God's, no, 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 God's a good God. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. So what if this year was your year to step into abundant life? Lord, I just pray for every person here today, God, that we would move from fear to faith. Lord, wherever we've been afraid to take a risk, wherever we've been afraid of what people think, or God, wherever we've maybe settled in habits, disciplines in our life that need to change, words, thoughts, actions, behaviors, God. I pray that this would be a year that we shift from that place of, of living in the natural to stepping into a supernatural momentum. God, help us to see what you see. Help us to say what you've told us to say. The Bible says, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor man say I am rich. Let the blind man say I can see. It's what the Lord has done for me. God, I pray this year we would activate a life of faith. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I repent of my sins. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your salvation. And I receive faith. And I'm gonna live by faith. And I'm gonna live for your glory. And one day, when I step into eternity, I will hear those words, well done thou good and faithful servant. Lord, I'm all yours. Use my life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you, Victory. God loves you. Hey, if you want to get a picture with my grandmother, grand grand, she's going to be out in the lobby. She would love to get a picture with you. If I ever got to shake your hand, I would love to do that in the center exit doors in the lobby. Have a great week. You got the victory. Go share it with other people around you. Down at the altar, if there's anything we could do for you, pray with you, give you a Bible, bag of groceries, connect you in a connect group and discipleship class. We're here to help you. We love you so much. Next Sunday, John Bevere is bringing the word. Don't miss it. Bring your friends. Get back here next Sunday at 11 a.m.